Hello, my name is John Landy. I'm a retired professor at the University of Missouri Law School Center for the Study of Dispute Resolution. This is the second lecture in a series about how lawyers can help clients in litigation. The first lecture, I talked about how lawyers generally can work well with clients and counterpart lawyers. This lecture is going to focus on the use of litigation interest and risk assessment techniques in working with clients, we call that Lyra. The next one we'll talk about using Lyra in negotiation with the other side. And the fourth lecture, we'll talk about how to help clients make decisions using all of the information in the preceding three lectures. Again, these lectures are based on experiences in the United States, some of which are applicable in every country, some may not be applicable in some countries. So there are variations between countries and is also within countries. So all of this may not be applicable for uh, in every place in the United States or any other country. You will get copies of PowerPoints of these lectures with links to more information. And you can recognize the links because they are in blue and they are underlined. Now, this is based on a book that I co-authored with Canadian law professors Michaela Keat and Heather Haven. It is a practical guide with lots of checklists. It is based on research combining research on risk assessment as well as early dispute resolution. It's oriented primarily for advocates, for lawyers representing clients, but also is relevant for mediators. And here's a link where you can find out more about the book. And of course, I'll be talking about this in this lecture and the next one. So what's the goal of Lyra? It's to improve party decision-making. This is a fundamental ethical obligation of lawyers in the United States at least, and I suspect in most, if not all countries. Lawyers are agents of parties, that parties are the principals, they're the ones who should be making the decisions about the major goals and ways to handle cases. Obviously lawyers make many decisions about how to actually implement strategies to achieve those goals. And the goal of Lyra is to help improve results for parties and also for courts and society by reducing decision errors in going to trial after rejecting a good settlement offer. In the United States, there are many, there are several research studies that have found that at least one side has rejected an offer that was not, that, that was better than the result they get at trial. And this is a horrible result. So can you imagine if you're representing a client and they, you get an offer, let's say you're representing a plaintiff and the other side offers you a hundred thousand and you go to trial and only get a judgment of 50,000. That's a horrible result. You would have been, and your client would have been much better off to accept the settlement and avoid all the time and stress and delay and expense of going to trial. And unfortunately there are many cases, actually most cases, or the, the vast majority, of, well, let me back up. There are, um, in, in most trials, one side or the other has made a bad decision to reject a settlement offer. And you wanna avoid that. And this process is designed to help you avoid these decision errors. And part of that is reducing the tangible and intangible costs of litigation. If the clients are spending less money and time and having less intangible costs in litigation, then their net result is better. And that's really what Lyra is designed to do is to help clients get better results. So what are some of the causes of bad decisions? Some of them are errors due to cognitive and motivational biases. And we talked about that in the first lecture, including 
And then another one is dynamics of lawyer client relationships producing what we call a conspiracy of optimism and prison of fear that inhibit candid assessment. The conspiracy of optimism is one where both the lawyer and the client want to put the best face on the case. The client doesn't want to appear to be foolish or silly, and the lawyer wants to maintain the client's confidence so that there's a bias to be as optimistic as possible. And the prison of fear, as discussed in the first lecture, talks about fear of negotiating or even suggesting negotiation. And part of the problem is that many lawyers are reluctant to communicate clearly and specifically about litigation risks. Partly that's because the law is very complicated and it's hard for lawyers to explain it and for clients to understand it. And, um, and the lawyers are afraid that because litigation is so uncertain that they uh, can't predict with a lot of confidence what the outcome is going to be. So what are some of the benefits of using this Lyra process? You can help clients understand their interests and the litigation risks better. You can identify key legal and factual uncertainties, estimate possible outcomes, and develop bottom lines, as we'll discuss. You explicitly consider tangible and intangible costs, which many lawyers do not factor into the decision making. And it can help you and your clients develop wise and effective litigation, negotiation, and mediation strategies. So how do you do it? First thing is you use good legal skills of asking good questions and listening carefully. As I described in the first lecture, many lawyers do not listen carefully and many clients are frustrated about it. Listen carefully. And then figure out what the dispute really is about jointly with the clients. Don't assume that it's necessarily about winning, that the, it's or about the correct interpretation of the facts of the law. It may be, but it may be about other sources of conflict. So your job is to be a diagnostician of the conflict. And you can ask questions like, what's most important to you in this case? And why haven't the parties settled so far? As I've mentioned before, and I will mention again, because it's so important, parties often want things in addition to financial outcomes. And lawyers, many lawyers, think only in terms of the financial outcomes. And if you ignore these other things, then you're not serving your clients well. And some of these other goals include being treated with respect by the other side, maintaining good relationships, developing favorable precedents, getting apologies, possibly getting future employment or recommendations. There are lots of things that clients may want. And what are some of the common sources of conflict? Maybe that they have a longstanding relationship conflict and it's bubbling up into a legal dispute. Maybe the parties don't trust each other. They have poor communication. They're afraid of looking weak and losing. They're concerned about setting precedent. Sometimes the conflict is because the lawyers want to perform for a clients and show that they're really fighting hard, or sometimes lawyers want to increase their fees. And sometimes conflict is about unrealistic expectations about the trial outcome. And so each side thinks, well, they'll get a better result if they go to trial, and that that's the reason why they're having conflict. And that sometimes is a source of conflict, but there are many other sources, including some that aren't listed here. So what should you do? You should ask your clients how you can be helpful. Don't just assume that they want you to tell you, tell them what they want to hear. They may want your candid assessment of the likely court outcome. They may want your help in understanding the other side's views. They may want advice about litigation or negotiation strategy. So the bottom line, the most important thing is don't assume, ask your clients and listen carefully. You also wanna understand the other side. Ask the clients what they think the other side's perspectives and goals are. 
then ask if they think that any of the other side's perspectives or goals are justified. Now, the clients may be so opposed to the other side that they all say that their the other side is completely unjustified. But if you develop a good relationship with your clients, you may get them to acknowledge that the other side may be right in part, and that may help you and your client understand the situation and develop a good strategy. And then ask if their assessment affects, you know, the, the, of the other side's perspective affects your client's assessment of the likely court outcome. And your clients may be able to identify things that would help persuade the other side to change their assessment. So now I'm going to talk about the structure of Lyra. There are three elements, the expected value of the court outcome, the tangible cost of continuing to litigate, and the intangible cost of continuing to litigate. Note that this can and should be used before lawsuits are filed. So when it talks about litigation interest and risk assessment, it doesn't mean that you have to wait until litigation begins. It's actually better to help your client analyze this before a lawsuit has been filed. Now, the book generally focuses on monetary disputes, but it can include mon non-monetary issues. And it focuses on future costs, not the past or sunk costs that we talked about in the first lecture, which really aren't helpful in making decisions about how to proceed in litigation. Now, the standard advice is for lawyers to calculate the BATNA, is a term that's used, the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. In lawsuits, the BATNA is the expected court outcome. So if you think that if you go to court, the court will give a, uh, a judgment for 100,000, that's the BATNA. And the general principle is that the party should not accept a settlement worse than the BATNA. So if you're representing a plaintiff and you think that the court is going to give a judgment for 100,000, then normally the advice is, well, you shouldn't accept a settlement less than 100,000. But the BATNA doesn't reflect the costs of continuing to litigate, the tangible costs of legal fees and expenses, and the intangible costs such as stress and harm to relationships and lots of others that we'll talk about. So let's just look at the tangible costs. So assume again, you're representing a plaintiff and you think that the court would uh, give a judgment for 100,000, but that it would cost 20,000 in legal fees and expenses to get that judgment. Well, the client would actually be better off to accept anything over 80,000 because you'd be deducting the 20,000 of tangible costs and or future tangible costs and legal fees from the 100,000 in, um, in, in the, the court judgment. So really you should be focusing on the bottom line and not just the BATNA. The BATNA is part of the bottom line. So the bottom line combines BATNA and the, the costs. So let me go into more detail about these three elements. The first one is the potentially unfavorable court outcome um, or the, the, the court outcome, which may be favorable, unfavorable. It can provide substantial benefits to parties in society. Parties may get a good result in litigation and trial, but it's inherently risky and they may get unfavorable court decisions. And the party's expectations about the court outcome often are major factors in negotiation, as I've just described. The tangible costs. Litigation imposes tangible costs, including the legal fees for represented parties and legal expenses for things like discovery or payment of experts. And then there are intangible costs. Being a party in litigation imposes many intangible costs, such as stress causing physical and psychological harm. Many lawyers don't really think about this and don't really recognize how stressful litigation can be and how much harm it can cause to clients and how important that this may be to them. And it'd be something, and it's one reason in the United States that many parties settle because they don't wanna continue going through the litigation process. It can cause feelings of unfairness 
and being disrespected and being victimized. Not only for plaintiffs, but defendants can feel victimized by having to go through the litigation process. They may feel stuck in a dispute, not being able to get on with life or get on with their business because the litigation is just consuming them, it may damage their relationships, can harm their reputations, and can undermine opportunities because people are investing so much time and money in the litigation that they don't have time and money to invest in other things. These intangible costs are very important to parties, sometimes more important than the court outcome. Instead of performing, I'm gonna say it again, people often ignore or undervalue intangible costs, which reflect the party's interests in the litigation. And if you consider the valuable, uh, value of intangible costs, it may reduce the expectations for monetary outcome, making it easier to settle. So for example, in that case of the plaintiff, who expects to get a judgment of 100,000, but would pay, um, well, would say that it's worth 20,000 to avoid going through the litigation, to continue going through the litigation, any result over 80,000 would be in their interest. So not just the 100,000 of the bat of the court outcome, but the 80,000, which reducing their expectations makes it easier to settle. So how do you discuss intangible costs with clients? There are lots of ways of doing it. You can ask, you said relationships or whatever they've told you were important to you. How would going to trial affect your relationships? You can coach them. You can say, well, when I see people late in litigation, they often say that it's taken a toll on them. Or you can delegate. You can say, please discuss this with your spouse or, spouse or your boss about how going to trial may affect you. Or you can tell them, going to trial is likely to hurt your reputation and keep you from doing things you want to do. So there are lots of different ways you can discuss intangible costs with clients. So you can ask individual clients, how much less would you accept or how much more would you pay to resolve a case in say three months instead of a year? or to resolve it today, if you're in negotiation or mediation, instead of waiting for a year to get a trial result. How much would, it, would less would you accept or more would you pay, would you pay to avoid the risk of losing a trial? Would you prefer to have a public trial and get a court decision or to settle so that you can avoid the publicity and avoid the risk of losing? So these are questions that can help clients figure out what's important to them and how much they're willing to pay or how much less they're willing to accept in order to resolve a dispute. And for organizations, you can ask questions like, how much time will the case require of officers, executives, and other employees? How would the case affect the business's organization's goals and opportunities? How would it affect the potential for growth and innovation? How would the case affect employee morale, absenteeism, or conflict? How would your case affect your brand and reputation? And again, you can ask some questions about what it's ultimately worth to them. How much would it be worth it? How much would it cost to counteract the problems you've just identified? For plaintiffs, how much would it be worth to avoid these problems? For defendants, in addition to payments for liability, how much more would it be worth to avoid these problems? So those are the intangible costs. Here are the tangible costs. You can discuss how much they've spent so far in litigation fees and costs and estimate how much more they probably would spend if they go to trial. And you probably won't have exact figures. Round numbers are fine. That's probably the best you can do. And then you want to talk about the likely trial outcome. And we suggest that you do this at, after talking about their interests, because this reflects that you are really interested in their concerned about their interests and not just the trial outcome. But obviously, the trial outcome is important. And as I mentioned before, you can tell clients that research shows 
at least in the United States, that in most trials, one party is unrealistic and gets a result worse than in settlement. And the studies show that in about two thirds of the case, and sometimes more, one side or the other gets a worse result at trial than in settlement. And you can ask if they want you to give a realistic assessment, not just an overly optimistic one. And you can be confident that you can persuade the court about some issues and less certain about others. So you can discuss your uncertainties and how you would address them, being candid about the risks involved and the uncertainties. And by doing this, you can help develop a realistic range of likely court outcomes. And based on this, you can develop an expected value of the court outcome. And lawyers do this in many different ways. Lawyers have experience with similar cases. They conduct legal research and discovery to collect factual information and evidence. They consult with other lawyers to ask about how they would assess this case and what they expect would happen if they go to trial. You can use decision trees, which is a process where you estimate the various contingencies, legal and factual contingencies, and you uh, assign probability estimates and likely outcomes, and you combine them to develop an estimate of the likely court outcome. Uh, this can be complex, and there are software programs that help people do that. Uh, increasingly, there's what's called big data, large databases about court decisions and artificial intelligence tools, which may be increasingly used in the future. And these different methods and the choice of the methods depend on many different factors, including the amount at stake, lawyer's experience, and the client preferences. So for example, in a smaller case, you don't wanna spend as much time and money as in a bigger case, which may be worth the investment of the time and money. And of course, that's something that you'd wanna discuss with your clients. So you wanna discuss the trial risks with your clients and you can discuss it in many ways, much as we talked about discussing the intangible costs. You can identify risks. So for example, you might say, well, if you go to trial, many judges would have questions about a certain issue. And you can quantify the risks. You can say, well, I think that the odds are for example, two to one, you have a, that the judge would decide this way about a certain issue, which may be in your favor or not. And you can predict an outcome. You can say, I think that most judges would decide a certain way about this issue. Now, in our Lyra book, we developed a simple framework, which is using decision tree logic for estimating the mathematical value of a court outcome. And it combines the process into a few steps, and it estimates the probable resolution of key legal and factual is issues to estimate a court outcome. And it explicitly includes both tangible and intangible costs to generate the bottom line for settlement. And you can vary assumptions to develop a range of likely court outcomes. So you, because litigation and trial are so uncertain, you can't have confidence that it's, the result is going to be just one possible outcome. You can recognize that it may be a range of outcomes from a possible low to a possible high outcome. So here are the steps in this, this simple framework. The first one is to estimate the court outcome. So you wanna estimate the risks regarding liability. So just to make it simple, you may say there's a, 75% chance that the court would find in favor of a plaintiff. And then the second step is to estimate the damages. And you can say, well, the damages might be 100,000 if the court finds in favor of the plaintiff. And then the third step is to multiply the, estimate the court outcome by multiplying step one by step two. So if you figure there's a 75% chance that the court will find in favor of the plaintiff and would find 100,000 uh, as the, the damages, then the estimated court outcome would be 75,000. 
75% times 100,000. So that's your BATNA, the estimated court outcome. But you're not done yet. You need to calculate the bottom line. So you want to estimate the tangible and intangible costs. So if you take the estimated court outcome as being 75,000, and then you say, well, the tangible costs, the additional tangible costs of going to trial would be 10,000. And the intangible costs, what the client values avoiding going to trial might be 15,000. So if you deduct the 10,000 and the 15,000, then the bottom line would be deducting step four from step three, taking the 75,000, subtracting 10,000 and 15,000, and the bottom line actually would be 50,000. So the client would be better off by accepting 50,000, anything more than 50,000, um, than going to trial using this simple framework. So that's how you do it. You develop a bottom line by adjusting the estimated BATNA values, the estimated court outcome by the amount of the tangible and intangible costs. And there are a variety of ways to estimate the BATNA values in addition to the mathematical calculations. Some lawyers really are comfortable and clients are comfortable with these mathematical calculations. Some aren't. And that doesn't matter. However you estimate the likely court outcome, um, you still want to estimate the tangible and intangible costs to deduct them so that you can calculate the bottom line. And bottom lines are important as tripwires to end negotiation if parties can't reach an acceptable agreement. So for example, in that last example, if the plaintiff sets a bottom line of 50,000, that means that if the defendant doesn't offer as much as 50,000, if they only offer 20,000, then the plaintiff may decide that it's worth going to trial instead of settling. And there are major elements in negotiation strategies that parties focus on getting a better result than in trial. So if the plaintiff decides that it wants to get at least $50,000, then it may start by demanding $100,000, $150,000, or $200,000 so that it will end up getting more than a settlement offer of $50,000. Now, most of what we've been talking about has been uh, in civil litigation, but you can uh, adapt these concepts for criminal cases. So in criminal cases, the expected court outcome may include things like the length of a sentence for a defendant, the amount of the fines, whether sentences of going to prison are consecutive or concurrent. That means whether they're following each other one after another or whether they're imposed at the same time. So if you have two concurrent sentences of 10 years, that means a 20 year sentence as opposed to two consecutive or, or concurrent sentences being um, two uh, 10 years that uh, would result in only 10 years or consecutive sentences would result in 20 years the outcome may be probation or conditions of probation. So these are the expected outcomes that you'd be looking at and the tangible costs. And they can differ for defendants with private counsel and public defenders. Public defenders in the United States, clients with public defenders pay very little. With private counsel, the defendants pay a lot. For prosecutors, the prosecutors don't have to pay, but they have limited resources to cover their entire caseload. So they have to consider whether it's worth investing more time in going to trial in a given case, um, because that means that they'll have less time for other cases. And then the intangible cases, the intangible costs and interests, defendants may be concerned about harm to family members, losing jobs, and numerous collateral consequences. And collateral consequences may be if the Defendant is convicted, that may affect their ability to get a job. Housing um, may affect immigration, may affect all sorts of other things. And so these are intangible costs, things that the court won't impose directly, but they're collateral consequences of conviction. 
And then prosecutors may be concerned about consistency with similar cases, their feelings of justice, compliance with prosecutorial policies, impact on victims, the prosecutor's reputation, potential for publicity, and effect on their win rate. So there are lots of factors that go into decision making in criminal cases that are, as you can see, very different from civil cases. And this also can be applied in transactional negotiation. And in transactional negotiation, the expected outcomes are the net profit from the plausible outcomes. Basically, if you're trying to consider whether to accept a, negotiate a, a negotiated outcome in a transaction, you want to think about how much profit your client will get, which may be affected by many different factors, such as the financing that's available, the diligence of the contracting parties, whether the other side is going to do a good job or not, how efficient it's going to be, what the reaction of consumers will be, um, what market competition will be, what government actions will be. So basically, you're trying to figure out what the net profits are going to be if you enter into the transaction. The tangible costs are costs of negotiating and consummating deals. Now here, there may be intangible benefits as well as intangible costs of the negotiation. And indeed, parties often are concerned about the intangible benefits, which may be an improved public image by having this deal, a development of ongoing business relationships, so expanding a market and increasing their technical capability. So those are factors that clients and lawyers should be considering in considering the uh, transactional negotiations. And then of course, there are also intangible risks, which include lost opportunities to pursue other transactions, uh, organizational dysfunction, or damage reputation if the deal blows up. So this is a basic overview of the way lawyers can help clients think about a wide range of cases. We mostly talked about civil litigation, but you can see how it can apply in criminal litigation as well as in transactional negotiations. So that's the end of this lecture.